Jewelry design is a big business, as the Egyptian entrepreneur in our next story demonstrates. You see, Aza Fahmi is a renowned jewelry designer, and her craft school is now attracting international students who want to promote independent and creative designs. Here's Leila Ogaril with the details. Aza Fahmi has been doing this for years, but for these students, jewelry making is still a learning process. They're picking up new skills at the craft school, sponsored by the renowned designer, hoping to become the next generation of jewellery makers. Azza's jewellery is marketed across the world, and her pieces have been worn by the likes of pop stars Rihanna and Josh Stone. But her school was created with the intention of helping local students. A lot of people want to learn but can't go to Europe, so why not open up a small school for them? In March, the studio will have been open for two years. Students here get a chance to work with silver, gold and stones. They're also learning metal smithing techniques and filing, soldering, casting as well as forging. They're also encouraged to think outside the box. I want them to think freely and be able to create what they want and be innovative. If they do that, they're spreading their wings to fly. Azza Fahmi has come a long way from her relatively humble beginnings as an apprentice to some of Egypt's most renowned jewellers some 40 years ago. With her unique blend of traditional and modern jewellery design, she's created an international brand and is one of the country's best-known entrepreneurs. She founded the Azza Fahmi Company in 1969 and now employs around 200 people in her factory, where they produce work that draws heavily on Egypt's Islamic and Christian heritage. Her students say they felt a change in themselves since joining the studio. When I started out, I had no experience in creating or producing anything, not even drawing, but I always felt like that there was this energy that needed to be released. It's not common to hear about someone that studies jewelry design, but I think it's, it's something that's, uh, that can be valid as much as any other art form. Azza Fahmi began selling her first pieces of jewelry at small fairs and exhibitions. She used to rely on friends and family to attend and spread the word. But now her company has numerous stores in Cairo and the Middle East, as well as outlets in the United Kingdom. Fantastic to see people taking so much initiative to get... Would, would, would you make your jewellery like that? That's quite I think now I'd really. want to, yeah. Yeah. After having seen that. Some really intricate pieces there. Susanna, you've got a nice piece of jewellery there, a nice necklace. It's, you know, that would look quite nice, I think. Yeah, I think that would work really well. But, hey, well, from a jewellery designer in Egypt to a jewellery designer in our Living the Life studio. Good evening, Audwin Pesson. Good evening. Thank you so much for coming. Um, great to see an initiative like that. What's, what are your thoughts on that story? Yeah, it, I think it's, uh, it's really good to see that they're not only teaching the craft, but they're also taking care of um, developing new designs and the ideas. Creativity, yeah. Because to me, it is all interwoven. You cannot do one without the other. Mm. And it seems like something's a, a very intricate skill at work here. It can start very basic, but um, of course, there is unlimited room for intricacy in, in the design and in the technique and sometimes the, the more intricate techniques to me they're always very challenging and I want to crack them, I want to yeah. have a go at them and, and, and get a good result. That's... For a beginner, where would you start when it comes to jewellery making? Uh, I, I always started with a hammer, like this. <laughs> okay. Yeah, my dad bought me that when I was 13. So. And so I the first thought that comes to your mind when you, uh, when you want to make jewellery, get a hammer. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well, soldering yeah. is another thing that's great fun, lots of fire, heat and, and uh, um, hot fingers, um, and lots of noise, that's good, yeah. Great, and you're going to make some pieces for us, so do you want to get started <laughs> and explain to us what, you're going, what we're doing here? Um, I've... Uh, that's, that's a very... There's some metal, uh, so yeah. that's quite an important part of this, I'm, I'm yes, guessing. Yes, starting with a bit of metal yeah. is a good... Well, this is silver. But um, to start with, you would probably find a cop copper cable somewhere yeah. and strip the insulation off and you'd have a starting piece cool. of metal. Brilliant. Um, and are these ma um, materials readily available if you wanted to go and buy them? Some basic, because, you know, for dressmaking, you'd go to a fabric store and, and buy some fabric. What would you do if you were into jewellery making? Where would you go? Um, 
uh, well, there are places uh, that sell ready-made silver wire like this. We would obviously m be able to make that wire as well, but yeah. um, to start with, you can probably ask a jeweler yeah. who makes jewelry whether he can order some for you. Um, and uh, you probably find online places that would sell silver wire. Yeah. And copper wire is, as I said, really. Brilliant. <laughs> you can... Awesome. You start that. Um, and meanwhile, um, we'll go to our other guest. Um, Susie, do you reckon we can make a necklace for Sophie in, in oh, the museum? Oh, wow. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> I mean, like I said, I was just mentioning your necklace earlier. So I think that that would be nice. Something to replicate like that. I don't know if we could do that here. <laughs> um, um, it's got quite a lot of bits. There's a lot of bits. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would require my that's my. That's where the dinosaur torch. teeth went. So I, I know. That's that's that, that <laughs> that's where all the dinosaur place. teeth went. Okay, so what are we doing here, Autumn? This is this we're just is a twisting. Very, very basic jig. Yeah. Actually, a rolling pin. Okay. Cut, <laughs> cut off and uh, two little. These are. Bits yeah. of drill bits, but uh, you could use nails or so, and you can. And you're just shaping that metal. Just bending this, and by the time we've got enough of those bends. Yeah. So um, what would that become? Would that become a, a necklace or? or at a that bracelet? size, I think it will become a bracelet. A bracelet. Yeah, a bit of. Ah. A... And all that's doing is just just weaving the metal along to create yeah. a kind of pattern. There. Yeah, but then, that's that's the first mm -hmm. bit, and. Then by the time, yeah, we want a bit of strength in the, a bit of elasticity. Here goes. Ah, yeah. the, see the hammer did, I was wondering what the hammer did. Flatten it out a bit. Yeah, I, everything I do has to. But, but why is it important to, to flatten it out? Um, it gives more tension in the piece, otherwise you could pull it right. apart again. Okay. You can still, but it's much more resilient now. And if I had my pliers with me, I could give this a bit tighter again. Th 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 there's a lot of effort going in there as well. With the, you know, quite a bit yeah. of strength you have to put in there. Yes, yes, yes. Because you, you always think of jewellery as very delicate and you think there'd be a very gentle touch to it, but... You have to do both and sometimes with the, with the, when you engrave a fine line um, or set, uh, set stones like in, in this piece here, very very nightmarish setting work yeah. Yeah. between the stones. You have to put the metal down. To have the control to do this, mm. um, you, you have to have a lot of power, although you're not doing much. You have, to, you have to basically be able to break at a quarter of a millisecond uh, so you don't slip into the stone. David, do you reckon you could do something like this? Well, possibly, because I do have a, a bit of uh, engineering experience. Ah. Uh, and I, I, I was discussing with him earlier um, the, the connection between jewellery making. I like this. You made a connection with the dinosaur straight away, and, and now you've uh, got a connection with jewellery. <laughs> and, and, uh, and scientific <laughs> instruments, because the, the area that we, we're in, in the studio, is actually Clerkenwell, yeah. was uh, the, the jewellery quarter of London, but also the centre for scientific instrument making. And that developed out of the oh. same skills. So you would go over and borrow an earring and then use that in your t telescope? Well, and not, not particularly, but the, <laughs> I mean, I mean, the same kind of metalworking, like polishing things, uh, w w was, is, is what you would use to make lenses and mirrors in microscopes and telescopes so uh, and, and the metal working as well making tubes and uh, making things to to find tolerances uh, originally I think in the medieval period it was jewelry and then it developed into clock making wow. and then that developed into scientific so instrument much making. History. Also, and how's David doing there I think he's doing actually quite well getting the yeah, idea of this, it, yes. of, of this, yes. um, uh, of this type of uh, well, marks out of ten the old type old. of work <laughs> Uh, so, yes. Marks out of ten. Well, for the, for the first attempt, we're, we're getting better, shall we? We're I getting better. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. we'll let you carry on and we'll go over to our next feature. From one handicraft to another now, there are parts of Pakistan where around about this time of the year you'll find the emergence of wool-filled wool quilts. It's an age-old craft that has been supporting families for decades. But now the craft is steadily fading out because of the growing popularity in synthetic quilts and comforters. Aldad Andrea has this story. Ali Akbar is a roving wulkada, known as a Dunaya. He comes from a village in the outskirts of Islamabad and says that not long ago, autumn in Pakistan would bring scores of roving Dunayas like himself into the villages across the country. It's the time of year when, in preparation for the coming winter, families recard the wool in quilts that have clumped over time and have become thin and less effective against the cold. 
walking from alley to alley with a donkey, which is his bowed carding instrument. The Dunaya would call out his familiar chant in a sing-song voice. As he does this, residents would emerge from their houses with an assortment of comforters that needed to be recycled. The Dunaya would then pull out the wool from old quilts and mattresses, recard it to eliminate the clumping, add some more, and then stuff the wool back into the cover, ready to be restitched. But since Pakistan started getting synthetic quilts, the business of the Dunaya has been on the decline. They can no longer compete with the lighter weight, washable, and easy to care for quilts that man made fibers offer. <laughs> This profession is dying, this craft is good, the material is long-lasting, but nowadays people believe in machine-made things. Wool carders work on a daily basis, and the amount of money they earn depends on the amount of cotton they card per day. So the reduction in demand for wool and quilts has drastically reduced income for men like Ali. Cotton fluffed up by hand isn't as supple and as soft as that done by a machine. A machine loosens out all the filaments of the compressed cotton wool completely. Stitching woolen quilts is a traditional craft in many South Asian countries and is passed from one generation to the next. They can last for 15 or 20 years and beyond because the wool inside can be recarded and refluffed. But since Pakistani houses are now properly insulated and free from draft, many people say synthetic quilts are warm enough in most houses. The wool comforters are slightly heavier, while these are lighter and warm. That is why people have started using them more and liking them more. But there's still the issue of price. The prices of most polyester quilts are still beyond the reach of poorly paid daily wage labourers who tend to be the bulk buyers of the low-quality woollen ones.